Hello there, it's that time of the week where we dive into all the news from the world of Warcraft. And this week has been surprisingly eventful, so let's dive right in. Remix Mists of Pandaria got off to a very strong start, but it wasn't long before we World of Warcraft players' tendency to over-optimise every bit of content we get started to uncover quite a few hiccups. The first hiccup was with the scaling of the event with players at the cutting edge quickly discovering that between level 60 and 70 our characters started to feel noticeably weaker with every level gained, with level 65 and above being particularly problematic with even tanks being one shot in group content and low level characters massively outdoing higher level characters on the damage meters. I have a suspicion that this was in part due to the content being tuned around players using the gear upgrade system. Unfortunately, as this uses the same event-wide currency bronze as all the other collectibles and transmog, this led to a strong reluctance to free spend freely on those upgrades. However, there's also no doubt that the scaling issues also meant that acquiring that bronze became suddenly a lot harder at max level. Players very quickly found the solution to that with an old favourite, right back from when Mists of Pandaria was current. That is, farming the Timeless Isle Skilt Frogs. These frogs hyperspawn, making group farming incredibly lucrative. This farm was extreme enough that players who used it quickly pulled far ahead of the rest of the player race, and this was enough to prompt the dev team to have to come in to work on a Sunday to deliver a nerf. The scaling issues were eventually addressed on Monday with the retuning of scaling from level 40 right the way through to 70, and it's fair to say that things are a lot better now on that front. This change also came along with a 25% boost to bronze from a lot of sources and a bunch of tweaks to bring the group content rewards a bit closer into line with the questing rewards. Meanwhile, the player base, with one major farm nerfed, very quickly found alternatives, with the horde farming Dalaran thanks to the 5.1 quest line and a wider goat farm over in the Valley of Four Winds. These two farms were also nerfed after about a day, followed by other NPC farms and things like Moggish and Vaults, Heart of Fear and an Alliance farm up in Dalaran too, and things did start to look like there was a bit of cat and mouse going on between the player base and the devs. Now many of these farms were a bit overpowered and have led to players who missed the farms falling noticeably behind to the point of even experiencing difficulties getting into groups. So the devs were, I think, right to act, but I do think that the cat and mouse game isn't a good look for the developers, and I hope that they will take a bit of a step back to examine the root causes of this player behaviour. My personal view is that the event could benefit from another bit of a boost to bronze acquisition. The amount of bronze required to upgrade gear feels excessively high given the rate that we acquire it, and having to use that currency in rewards and cosmetics as well just adds to the pressure that's been put in players. As this is a limited time event at the end of an expansion and it's completely isolated from the rest of World of Warcraft, letting things get a bit more relaxed and crazy could be a lot of fun for players and would help to reduce the gap that's been developing due to these farms. Blizzard have increased the bronze acquisition a bit, especially for group content, but those boosts have not felt super impactful to me and I do think that a little bit more is needed. This would also help to address one of the more common complaints from players, which is that the pace of progress feels a lot slower than Blizzard's marketing led us to believe. And this feeling of mismatch between marketing and reality also extends to the cloak, where I think that most players had got the impression that the cloak progress would be freely shared between alts, which hasn't really turned out to be the case, because in reality that sharing is limited to a subset of attributes and based on an achievement system which results in fairly limited buffs to cloaks and alts. It is true that the marketing didn't exactly say the cloak would work the way that most people expected it, but that expectation was in my view a very reasonable thing to take from the marketing, and I do think that Blizzard should take a long hard look at the way they market these types of events, as just as with Plunderstorm, it is in danger of leaving many players feeling a bit misled. It doesn't really matter what Blizzard's intent for the marketing is, ultimately players, like any consumers, are the judges of the accuracy of product marketing, and if it misses the match in terms of what it delivers, it can seriously harm player trust. 
And after the last few years, having burned through a lot of player goodwill and trust, that is something that Blizzard already has a bit of an uphill struggle to regain. And issues like this only serve to make that job unnecessarily more difficult. I have already seen players who are taking a break from the game saying that they had considered to come back for Remix, but are being put off by all the discussion and issues that people are reporting. Now, all of that is a very great shame. I personally have been having a ton of fun with this event. I'm personally not a big fan of those kind of extreme farms that have been developing as a meta, and I've been quite happy just running through the open world content with a few instances done here and there. And while the issues I mentioned were a problem for many players, they really haven't affected me all that much, or indeed most of the people I know. So my message to anyone thinking they're coming back is not to be put off. This event really is a refreshing and fun way to round out an expansion. Blizzard have been very proactive in addressing many issues as they come up, including buffs to rare respawn and drop rates, the addition of shirts and tabards, the glyph of shadows for priests, and a bunch of boosts to the legendary cloak plower from raids and dungeon. And they've even made sure that the all-important access to Ordos is available for folks who don't have the original mock legendary cloak. But what about all of you? How have you been finding the bronze grinding remix? Or are you finding it hard to even make time for remix with all the rest that's going on in game? Let me know in the comments down below. Despite all of that interest in remix, the live version of the game is season 4 is also still tripping away quite nicely. Something that has seemed to have fallen a little bit below the radar is that with this week's reset, the Mythic Plus NPC Lindormy is now again selling the Mythic Plus catch-up gear chests. These account-bound chests cost 350 flight stones and are a great way to get rid of excess stones if, like me, you seem to be constantly capping them out. The chests offer a random 496 item level gear item, which is a great boost for alts and is actually the best catch-up gear that's available in-game at the moment. The only one downside of it is that you do need to have a Mythic Plus score of at least 1000 in order to be able to purchase the chest. It's now time to move on to the War Within Alpha news, so do be aware that while I avoid story spoilers, I will be discussing other unreleased game content in this section. If you want to completely avoid spoilers, do feel free to skip over to the classic section later in the video. The big news this week was the introduction of a story mode for the new raid. This mode will allow players to do the final boss encounter in the raid either solo or in a small group of up to 5 players with reduced mechanics and difficulty. This will allow players who aren't normally able or willing to do group content to experience the end of the main story and complete the quest, something that I think will be very welcome for those players. Even for myself, as someone who raids, I personally find it very difficult to properly experience the story in raids and dungeons, as my focus in group content is to support my overall group and not to waste their time or even my own time following the story, so it's very likely that even myself will want to run through this mode at least once. Except, and here's the bad news. Blizzard planned to release this with the opening of the final wing of LFR, which usually lands about 4-6 to six weeks after the main raid opens. My understanding is that the LFR timetable is due to a desire for players to be able to experience the raid with their guild first, but I personally think that this delay doesn't actually achieve that for many players. Speaking as someone who plays in what I would describe as a mom and pop guild, it can take us a few weeks to clear normal, and I'd estimate that about half the team end up clearing the raid in pugs first. And a lot of those are only doing it to get the story and complete that quest, so in practice that delay is actually counterproductive. As if the story mode did open in week 1, while well, we would all go in and do the story first, Many of those players I've just described would then go on to get their first group kill with their guild instead of as part of an anonymous pug, which is exactly the thing that I think Blizzard are actually trying to avoid, but not really succeeding in. In my opinion, one of the most persistent issues with the in-game story, at least since the time of Legion, has been poor pacing, and arbitrary time gates like this are a major factor in that issue. In Dragonflight, the renowned gating for the campaign reduced parts of the story to incoherence, and while it's rarely that severe, delaying the final climax of a story for a subset of the player base for as long as 6 weeks 
is not helping Blizzard to deliver that better paced storyline. Hopefully this is an area where Blizzard will take on board the feedback they are getting and will rethink this approach. This is an awesome tool that they could build on in future. For example, one of the big issues with the 10.1 storyline was that a part of that story was told by progressing through the raid. But even many of lower interested players like myself completely missed it due to us focusing more on our groups. The end result being that we all needed a novel video to explain it to us. Expanding the story mode beyond the final boss fight would give the developers a powerful new tool to ensure the story is more fully appreciated by players in-game where it should be, but that does need to be done at a pace that is dictated by the needs of the story and not by the whims of long-term repeatable gameplay development. On the subject of story, and Blizzard have continued releasing short stories for The War Within, and this week it's the turn of Angian to have the focus with The Calling by Christy Golden. I'm not going to share any details of the story, but I have found this to be a very enjoyable update, depicting Angian is experiencing the effects of PTSD after his domination by the Jailer in Shadowlands, but also providing an experience that could help explain Angian's gradual return into the mainline story. I'll put a link to the story down below. This story will be included in a collection of short stories to be released later this year. That book is advertised as having two exclusive short stories, so I have a suspicion that we're going to see a few more of these short stories being released for free. I'll also add a link to where you can pre-order the book if you want to. Last week, I reported on Blizzard's plans to give us more talent loadouts. Honestly, I'd expected that while an increase would be welcome, that it probably wouldn't still be enough for most of us. With this week's alpha, Blizzard managed to greatly exceed my expectations with a total of 40 slots. Yes, 40. For me at least, this will be more than enough to have a build for every raid and have a few for Mythic Plus in the open world as well, even for Awakened style season. This will allow me to no longer rely on add-ons for managing loadouts. While I have found an add-on that I do find very useful, it does sometimes interact with the built-in loadouts in awkward ways, and I suspect that for me, moving fully to the built-in system will offer a smoother experience. Another piece of news that I suspect character customization fans are going to greatly appreciate is the ability to hide your pants on our characters. The ability to hide other slots was introduced way back in BFA, but at the time, having pants on their characters remained mandatory. With more and more races having tattoos and other leg decorations, I think the ability to tastefully or not display them is going to be a nice boost. The Skyriding Talent Tree, Skyriding is the new name for dragon riding by the way, had also had a bit of a revamp with the removal of non-flight related talents. Blizzard have also revisited the plans they originally mentioned back at BlizzCon to reset talents and continue with the Dragon Glyphs. Under the new system, we're going to instead unlock our talent points, now known as Skyriding Proficiency, as we level up. And for those of us with already maxed out trees, we should be going into the new expansion with all the talents already unlocked. While on the subject of Skyriding, and Blizzard have not been resting on their laurels after enabling the feature for well over 150 of our older flying mounts, and they have continued to work on the remaining mounts. As of this build, there are only 5 flying mounts left which don't have Skyriding support. In a recent interview with Mr. GM, Associate Game Director Morgan Day suggested that all flying mounts will be able to Skyride, and with the number of non-skyriding mounts shrinking every few alpha builds, I suspect that this is going to be the case. And in the next expansion, the days of only having 4 or 5 relevant mounts are going to be gone, something that I suspect those of us who collect mounts to actually use them are going to greatly appreciate. The final change to skyriding is a little bit disappointing, as the maximum speed is being reduced from 830% to 705%. At the same time, the Riding Abroad debuff that reduces the speed in the old zones is being removed, meaning it will have a single consistent speed. Now, I personally am a bit disappointed to see this reduction. I never found the reduced speed in the old zones to feel very necessary, and while it's not a massive drop, it's very hard for me to understand why we won't be able to retain the current speed, which was one of the factors that contributed to the success of this feature.
We're now at the stage on the alpha where we can see the max level gameplay starting to take some shape. One thing that as a fan of open world content and questing has caught my eye came from fellow content creator Mr GM who spotted a return to Legion and BFA style emissary quests in The War Within. The previous iteration of the emissaries asked us to complete four or sometimes three world quests from a given faction to get a bonus reward. This time the ask is to do three world quests after which a fourth epic world quest opens up that rewards a chest that includes crest, gold and a chance at some veteran gear. I was a bit of a fan of the Lua Emissaries which back in BFA in my opinion offered the best open world gearing we've ever had in the game, especially for alts. One of the first disappointments for me of Shadowlands was the migration to Callings which were originally promoted to us as a world quest 2.0 but instead delivered a huge reduction in the volume and diversity of world quests and were overall more annoying to complete, although they did turn out to be a good source of raw gold. It remains to be seen if this new system can recapture the Legion and BFA magic for world quest players. Since Shadowlands 9.2, while we have seen an increase in innovation in individual world quests, the current world quests draw from far too shallow a pool meaning that the same quests come around far too quickly and this leads to them becoming very stale very early after release. If this move is accompanied by Legion or even BFA style levels of depth and diversity in that world quest pool then this could offer a very nice boost to world content. There's one last piece of mount news which is that for the pre-patch event for the War Within there's going to be two new mounts. The Remembered Gold Griffin and the Remembered Wind Rider. These will be available from the events vendor. These mounts do seem to be faction specific, so hopefully Blizzard will follow the usual pattern where if you get the Alliance one, you automatically get the Horde one and vice versa, and that we don't have to farm these on two factions. Moving over to Classic, and just after I recorded my last video, Blizzard dropped a major update on the timing of the next phase of Season of Discovery. I think that Blizzard have probably noticed that there is rather a lot going on across the Warcraft franchise lately and they've decided to slow the pace of release down a bit with the current Phase 3 lasting longer than the previous phases. Blizzard have said that they aren't ready to announce a date for Phase 4 yet but they will be giving us plenty of notice when they do. I haven't played Phase 3 myself but from players that I know who do, the overall feeling is that it hasn't landed as well as the previous phases, with the transition from 10 man to 20 man raiding proven to be particularly problematic for many groups. And it would not surprise me if this delay is in part due to Blizzard wanting a bit more time to try and tweak their plans for the next phase and I do wonder if they are revisiting their plans to have at least some of the max level raids by 40 man. The slowdown will also I suspect help to reduce the pressure on the WoW server team who have an awful lot to juggle with major releases, alphas and PTRs across all the game versions. To that end, Blizzard have also announced plans to have a limited PTR for Phase 4 of Season of Discovery to allow for class and combat testing. They've also confirmed that at level 60, they plan to follow a similar pattern to Vanilla Classic with Molten Core and Anixia first, followed by Blackwing and Zogarub a few weeks later. All this does not mean that Phase 3 is being left to its own devices though. With an upcoming release, there's going to be an increase in power level from Sunken Temple gear to help bridge a gap towards Phase 4. The big event though this week was of course the release of Cataclysm Classic. In many ways this has been a pretty uneventful release and it's kind of a bit below the radar on the news front, but we have had one update just before release with the confirmation that World Bosses and Baradins Hold Raid will release on the week of June the 4th. PvP players are also going to be able to enjoy increases in the Valor and Conquest caps by 60%. That's to 1600 for Valor and 4k for Conquest, starting with the second weekly reset after release. Well that's all I have for this week. If you found this week's new video even vaguely interesting then please do let me and the YouTube algorithm know by hitting that like icon and if you'd like to support my channel please hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. 
Next week, I'm going to be starting a new series of explorations into different aspects of The War Within, and you'll want to be notified whenever they go live. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.